some things that, you know, educators, teachers, you know, even the support personnel can do, maybe some best practices or things to kind of think about to kind of make sure that, that you know, they're helping students maintain a kind of uh, healthy mental health uh, mindset. I I have really appreciated seeing how teachers have adapted their work with students and um, and and really it's teacher appreciation week by the way I don't know if you guys know that, but, <laughs> yeah um, I really appreciated teachers through this because I've seen so many of them be so innovative and creative in the way that they are um, developing engaging lessons that give multiple points of entry and access for students and I think. Um, those particular um, those, those kinds of activities where you're allowing students to engage um, when and how they can and really emphasizing the engagement over necessarily maybe the academic standard. Um, I think that has been um, the best entry point for some students that have struggled with this. They might be overwhelmed um, with the digital platform that the, that the lessons are presented on, and they might be um, overwhelmed with um, the idea of trying to set their own schedule and structure for the independent learning. They might even be overwhelmed with the academic task because frankly, school is hard for them. And so um, it's not something they want to do independently. And it's something that's really hard to do independently. Um, but when I see that teachers have developed some kind of activity that gives a that gives an entry point for students to engage, even if it's just that social engagement with the teacher or the rest of the class. Um, I think that's one of the most important things that we can be doing for those kids that are struggling in this in this kind of setting is continuing um, to ensuring that they continue to access that education and that they see that value um, in the education, even if the focus isn't necessarily on achieving a certain academic standard. And and I hope this answers the question. But um, one of the observations I've made is how um, how uh, the you know this uh, current environment um, of of you know of relying on technology has really maybe brought um, I think you know classic teaching and what students are used to engaging in with regards to you know their phones or social media you know. A, a giant step closer to each other. Um, one example the other day was a student, you know, who has um, a significant difficulty writing and the teacher um, was using Flipgrid, which is still a little new to me, but I guess it's sort of like short little, you know, um, videos, less than 30 seconds, and then students are answering each other's questions. And um, he loved it. I mean, it was really quite engaging. And not that the teacher couldn't use that if we were in session, but I think this has really sort of pushed teachers, um, you know, many out of their comfort level to learn these, you know, new um, technologies, these new apps, these new ways of kind of gathering information. And I, I think there's some silver lining there. We're putting a lot of stress and uh, pressure on teachers right now to kind of reach out to students. And uh, they're doing, you know, kind of, uh, you know, going above and beyond right now. Um, and maybe we need to, you know, not maybe, we need to make sure that they're okay mentally. Uh, and that they're not, you know, kind of that they're um, uh, doing okay. And I was just wondering, is there any maybe advice for them in dealing with all this kind of a little bit of self-care thoughts yeah. that, um, you know, things that they should be considering for themselves? Yeah, and yeah. actually, the, oh, go ahead. No, you go. No yeah, so, um, you know, I had two thoughts and, and actually you use the word that I think um, school psychologists and even NASP has been uh, promoting for several years now, that idea of self-care, or sometimes we'll call it care for the caregivers. Um, you know, the, there's um, a lot of attention being paid on doctors and nurses because they are on the front lines of the um, physical health around this. But I think, you know, unfortunately, sometimes education can be the unsung heroes, right? Where that is a profession where they expected the same level of standard, the same level of education, continuation of what it was we were doing, but in a drastically different um, environment. And so I do worry about so many teachers that, um, you know, are trying to raise their families and manage their household and at the same time continue that, um, that same level of, of work. Um, so it's really difficult. In fact, 
I think on the morning show today, Melinda Gates was on there talking about a variety of aspects. But one of the things that she was highlighting was this tsunami of, um, you know, focus that's going to need to be on self-care and caregiving, uh, because if we don't take care of the people who are providing these services, then there will be, you know, even worse outcomes, I think, even after we find a vaccine. Yeah, I um, one of the things that we've been trying to do is try to continue in some capacity um, some of our, our naturally occurring teaming structures in the building that I work in. And, um, and part of that is to continue to try to engage in the best practice work, even if we're adapting it to a virtual setting, but um, also to keep people connected to those to those teams and to those people that they're that they're used to going to. So um, we had a, a data team meeting with um, teachers who teach English language arts um a couple of uh i guess it was last week and um it quickly i typically facilitate that meeting and we're we're looking at student data and um adjusting talking about how we adjust our instruction um, based on how students are learning and we knew that the focus was going to be a little bit different in that meeting and it was very clear early on that those teachers just needed a space to um, talk, uh, talk with one another um, about what they were experiencing and what was challenging. And, um, you know, of course, I'm texting um, the curriculum specialist that you know, I coach so doing and saying, like, let's just let this go because this is what they need. And, um, and, I, and I think it was helpful. But one of the things that resonated with me was that there was a, um, a brand new teacher um, who's been great. Um, in in her in her work with students, um, especially teaching literacy skills, and she said, you know, I'm really struggling because the thing that I am best at at this stage in my career is developing relationships with kids, and it's that interaction in the classroom. And she said, frankly, I don't I don't have a lot of faith in my skills as they relate to direct instruction. I I feel like I'm still developing those. But what I know how to do is I know how to build relationships and I know how to get kids to work and I know how to inspire kids so that they work for me. And she said, I don't know how to do that in this capacity. And she said, you know, 40% of my students are engaging in the activities. And I just, I feel like I'm failing the other 60%. And that was so hard to hear because I think that what she was communicating was is what I think any any teacher, veteran or otherwise, would communicate. They have high expectations for themselves. They want to see students succeed. And when students are struggling to engage in this platform, it feels like a personal failure. And it was so great to see the other teachers and, and staff members that were on that virtual meeting rally around her and, and really try to support her. And I think it was it was a really good way for them to hear from each other that, that lots of people are struggling, whether you're an expert in the instructional delivery or you're in, an expert in the um, relationship building that this is new for everybody and and we just have to keep learning from it and we have to keep doing a better you know keep coming back to coming back to this and trying to do better the next time around but um it really did it really did highlight for me that the teachers are struggling with this too mm -hmm. and it's not just the new format it's that they that they want to see students succeed they're concerned about their students um, they're concerned about each other and we're all trying to find ways to, to continue to connect and do our best. Does anything that may, you know, either maybe pitfalls or what not to do, that sometimes I feel like that can be as instructive as what to do, you know, maybe something you've seen or, you know, something to uh, just be, again, maybe be aware of, but, you know, I, I guess, you know, pitfalls or, you know, uh, mistakes that could possibly be made. And, because it is kind of like you said, it's a new environment for everyone. So maybe any thoughts along those lines? Um, the only one that I think I'm noticing that relates to the relationship that Shauna was just talking about is that idea that a lot is being put into email, um, and you lose a lot of that um, tone and care when it comes into an email. And so I'm speaking to a lot of students who are saying, the teacher said this, or the teacher emailed that, and she doesn't like me, or I'm really failing because I got three of those emails, um, or they're just form emails, you know, and they're not um, personalized. And then I'll speak to the teacher at some point, and I know that that was not their intention. That's not what they wanted to convey. But I think a lot of, um, you know, the communication is now going through words. And I think there are many, many pitfalls in something like that. 
I mean, I, I totally agree with Peter. Um, and then I think more broadly, I think about pitfalls and I think, um, one of the the pitfalls that I see is is schools and districts and educators who are just trying to keep going as if nothing has happened or nothing has changed. Mm -hmm. And I think that is a major pitfall. I think to not acknowledge that things are strikingly different um, at this time than they were two months ago um, is incredibly concerning. And so um, I've been incredibly appreciative of um, people that I work with who are open to adaptation and innovation and understanding that the work does not look the same um, today as it did in February and in March. And so I think to just continue to move forward and to not be ready to adapt um, the work or the design or the model um, for this situation, I think that's a tremendous pitfall. Um, I've been so appreciative of the volunteer leaders and the staff at um, the National Association of School Psychologists because we have done a pivot and we haven't lost our, our mission and our vision and our focus on, on supporting students and school psychologists and families and educators. But um, you'll, if, you know, if you looked at the work that was coming out of our association a couple of months ago and the work that's coming out now, it is different and it is incredibly responsive to a shift in, in education as we know it. And I think that that's what we need to be doing in education writ large, um, recognizing that we have a tremendous body of knowledge and a lot of expertise, and, and we can adapt that to these times, but we can't continue to, to push forward and, um, and act as if, if things aren't markedly different. So I think being seeing, seeing how some people are adaptive and responsive to the situation, I think is a success. My concern is places where it seems like people are, are pushing forward without an acknowledgement that things are, are sh shocking different now than they were. Mm -hmm.